Okay, well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our presentation. Um, today, our presentation is titled, I Juggle Both Native and Western Science, Portraits of Native Identity in Computer Science for Academic Persistence. Um, we will be talking about our current study, Native Women and Two-Spirit Individuals in Computing Higher Education, a photo elicitation study of persistence, which we refer to as NOC2. In this presentation, we will see how Native students are asserting their identities in an academic field where they generally don't feel welcome, um, and we'll use photographs and quotes from the study to illustrate this. Um, right now, we are going to give brief introductions and land acknowledgement of the places where we live and work. Um, so I'm Kathy Dierenwater. I'm the Chief Program Officer at ACES. I've been with ACES for about five and a half years. Um, I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Um, I currently reside in Oklahoma in an area in a town called Shawnee. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge the, the land where I live and work as being the traditional homelands of the Osage and Wichita. Um, currently, it is also the homelands of um, tribes that were removed here, including the citizen Potawatomi Nation, of which my husband is a citizen, and Sac and Fox Nation, Kickapoo Nation, and the Absentee Shawnee Nation. Um, in addition to recognizing the land that we're on, I also want us to acknowledge the um, ancestors and, and people, Native people, who struggled and sacrificed so that we um, can be here today. And now uh, my colleagues are going to introduce themselves, so I will hand it over to Nuria. Hi. Um most of you know me. My name is Nuria Jomot Pascual. I'm a research scientist here at Turk, where I have worked for almost 13 years now. Um, I work from home, Athens, Georgia, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm in the traditional, traditional homelands of the Easter Band of Cherokee Indians and the Muscogee Nation. Christina? Um, well, Christina seems to be having trouble signing on. Um, she, well, her name is Christina Bibi Silva. She's a research assistant at Turk, where she's been for about two years. And she is in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And the offices of Turk are in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So both of them are in the territory of the Massachusetts and their neighbors, the Wampanoag, the Nipmuc peoples who have stewarded that land for hundreds of generations. Kathy? Oh, yep, sorry, that was unmuting. <laughs> Thank you, Nuria, for filling in for Christina. And um, we also wanted to say that Dr. Mia Ong gives um, her apologies for not being able to attend today. She had a pre-scheduled vacation. Um, that prevented her from being present. So we're happy Mia got some vacation and away time. Um, she is a senior research scientist and has been at Turk for 15 years. Um, this project is funded by the Women of Color in Computing Collaborative um, to study the experiences of Native women and two-spirit individuals in computer science undergraduate education. So next slide. Okay, so I'm going to give a description of the study. The methods we used are uh, three main parts, a literature review, photo elicitation, and focus groups. Our population is Native women and two-spirit individuals. Our research questions are, um, the first is, what is known and what is not known in the empirical literature about Native women and two-spirit individuals in computing higher education? And then what factors have influenced Native women and two-spirit individuals' decision to pursue and persist in computing higher education? What are the barriers to and enablers for persistence? The theoretical backgrounds we are using are critical race theory and intersectionality. 
And today we will highlight findings and stories from the photo elicitation interviews. Um, so findings from the literature review were um, quite interesting and, and insightful, especially for me because I talk so much about natives in STEM around higher education, K through 12. Um, and it was great to finally see the numbers of studies that are out there on these topics. So for native students in higher education in general, um, we found 38 pieces of literature. When you boil that down just to STEM, so specifically in the fields of STEM, then that reduced to 15, so less than half. If we were looking just at Native women in higher education, there were only five. And then women in Native women in STEM, it would be four. And two of those are in computer science, which is interesting. And I, I think speaks to um, there being a researcher who had a specific interest in Native women and computer science. Um, and then um, when we first started this literature review, we actually didn't have any papers to cite for Native Two-Spirit individuals in higher education. But then in the fall of 2019, um, Noria did find one paper, so we updated that. Um, but again, that was in higher education, and currently there are no papers uh, on Native Two-Spirit individuals in STEM. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit more about um, our method of photo elicitation. So this was our main data collection method. Um, in this method, participants take pictures that respond to prompts that we as the researchers provide them. Um, then we talked about these pictures in an interview and the combination of images and conversations accesses more areas of the brain, evoke different kinds of information, um, such as more detailed memories and emotions, um, than simply words alone. So the, the prompts in our study ask participants about three main topics. Um, the first is the barriers that they encountered, second being the, sort, the supports that they received, and then last, how they conceptualized their identities as Native students in computer science. And then I'll transition now to our main themes. So in our analysis of the interviews, we found five main themes, um, which we will develop further in the next slides. And those themes are giving back, Native versus Western science and culture, Native culture as a source of resilience, resisting colonization, and being two-spirit as a source of creativity. Um, now I'll hand it over to Noria. Um, also at the end of the presentation, we will talk about oh. what... I'm sorry, Nuria. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> what participants told us about how they experienced participating in photo elicitation. Um, and we will outline a few recommendations for institutions of higher education that are interested in recruiting and also, but mostly, retaining and supporting Native students in computer science and related disciplines. So going into the findings, um, our first theme is giving back. As part of this theme, we saw that participants viewed their education in computer science as strengthening their families and communities and as a means of maintaining the integrity of their cultures by doing things such as preserving their languages and mentoring younger members of their tribes. They used their education as a means to become agents of social change. This theme was present in all eight participants and was potentially the most salient one in terms of how often they talked about it and the passion that it elicited. Giving back was a recurrent theme in Diana's interview. She emphasized the importance of recipro reciprocating sorry, what she had received from her native community. She viewed her education in computer science a strengthening her family and community by planning on using her skills for cultural preservation, 
This is how she talked about it. I see coding and programming as an art. It's an art because you can express yourself in so many different ways with what you do and what you use your code for. I want to bring the two worlds together, my native world and my computer science world. They're pretty separate, or they would be. They wouldn't have any connection if you were an outsider. I want to bring my two identities together as a native woman and as a computer scientist. And so that's why I want to do the language preservation project to help me bring these two identities together. Our second theme is native versus Western science and culture. As part of it, we saw that participants were aware of the ways native culture and science and Western culture and science sometimes converge and sometimes diverge. They identified ways their cultures included scientific knowledge and looked for ways to preserve their native knowledge at the same time that they sought to learn Western science. Krista had found a way of bringing together her native culture with Western education through the philosophy of education implemented by the tribal college she attended. This is how she explained it. At my school, they have this diagram that incorporates the four cardinal directions, and they call it the net philosophy of education. And I didn't know this, but it's like a learning triangle, like in Western education, and is somewhat similar to the net philosophy of education that we implement here at our school. That was one thing I liked about my school, is that they have the Western education, like technology, and they implement it with our culture, and they intertwine them. And they came up with this, the net philosophy that helped me a lot to juggle both of them. And I was like, wow, that's really good because I want to learn technology and everything, but I also want to keep my tradition and everything intact. Our third theme is native culture as a source for resilience. As part of it, we saw that participants used their culture as a source of pride and strength to persist in computer science higher education. They were motivated to persist in their studies by a desire to explicitly challenge stereotypes of Native individuals as not being capable of being successful in computer science and tech. Lee talked about how learning more about her Native Hawaiian culture and scientific knowledge made her respect it as a legitimate knowledge system and identified it as a source for pride and strength to stay in computer science. This is how she talked about it. I identify as a person who's learning to knit culture with science, right? Native Hawaiians have always had science. Once I started to learn that and once I started to respect that, I had pride and that pride has allowed me to really continue in science, you know? I don't have to worry, we have another way, and it's the exact same level. So that's what gave me pride, and that was a barrier that was blocking me from really believing in myself into continuing in science. Our fourth theme is resisting colonization. We saw how participants' choices in pursuing computer science resist their tribe's histories of colonization. Participants talked about their elders' experiences of cultural erasure, through native boarding schools and forced removal, and how in turn their own choices as they get their degrees fight back the colonization pressures of higher education. Bell <clears throat> attended a predominantly white institution and wanted to show her pride in being native through how she presented herself. She wanted to challenge the stereotypes of what a native student can accomplish by succeeding in computer science and taking opportunities such as award ceremonies to signal to the world that she was being successful as a Native student. This is how she explained her experiences. I really like my laptop. I use data for Indigenous people by Indigenous people sticker. I really relate to that sticker. I'm a decolonizing the, academ the academy sticker, showing that as an indigenous person, I'm succeeding at this institution. At award ceremonies, I'll wear a ribbon skirt and a medallion. It's something that people aren't used to. I got a University Women's Association scholarship, and the women who donate to that are wealthy, older, white women. I thought it was interesting to see how I came dressed with my ribbon skirt. And anything I do, I want to tell people that I'm Native. Be obnoxious about it. Like, yeah, I'm Pawnee. 
I'm some some Seminole. I'm Creek, you know. One of our goals was to include two spirit individuals in the study. This term is relatively new, both in the literature and in common use. Researchers Jacob, Thomas, and Lang defined two spirit as a term coined in 1990 by Native individuals during the third Native American First Nations Gay and Lesbian Conference in Winnipeg. It originated as a term for contemporary Native LGBTQ plus individuals that has come to refer to a number of past and present Native roles and identities around gender and sexual categories and behaviors that emphasizes the spiritual aspect of one's life. However, there is no consensus around the meaning of the term to spirit as it varies by individual and culture. We did not define to spirit for our project and let participants identify themselves. David, one of the eight participants in the study, identified as to spirit. He told us about how his experiences were different from those of other men and how he considered that being to spirit provided him with two different perspectives when looking at problems and creativity. David talked about how though he's uh, male, his being to spirit allowed him to access different perspectives at the same time. He knew early on that he was different from others and realizing that he was to spirit provided him with the freedom to be himself and not have to pretend to be like the other men in his community. In his own words. I knew I was different from the other kids. I did all the same things like the other males, everything that everyone did too, but it's something different. And beyond that sometimes too, kind of made me have the perspective that, well, being me and being a two-spirit individual and being a college student at that, especially in my area, is a big step from all the males in my area, especially the ones I grew up with. I see two different perspectives from a male and a female role. After I realized it, it kind of made everything more at ease and made everything better. And I get to be myself even more and I get to show my true colors. I can actually show who I am. Having access to different perspectives was an advantage in computer science for David because he was able to approach problems in more complex and creative ways and helped him generate better solutions. This is how he talked about it. I feel like I approach computer science in a very, very different way, in a creative way. Being a two-spirit in computer science and in college and undergrad and everything made everything I do in the class kind of different than all the other kids. And then they want to learn off of me too. When they were in class, like this typical male, they only see the outside or the inside of a computer, or they see only one way. And then me, I see different ways of how to take this computer apart. Just being creative and try and find different ways to do the same thing as your peers, but do it in a different way or a more efficient or, or a better or a faster way. As you have seen throughout the presentation, the images that participants chose to use in their interviews were quite creative. In some cases, they used photography modification software to express the ideas they wanted to share with us. In other cases, they used metaphorical imagery. Even though we did not ask participants to share with us their experiences with photo elicitation, a few of them did. They told us that taking pictures and writing captions for this research project was a fun and engaging experience that allowed them to be creative with images and words and provided them with an opportunity to be introspective about their experiences in computer science. Kali was one of the participants who shared her experiences with photo elicitation with us. She was a career changer who had been a teacher before she went back to school to get her degree in computer science. When, she, when we interviewed her, she was about to go through major changes in her life. She was starting her last semester in the degree and had already accepted a computer science job at a large company in a different city. For her, responding to the research project's prompts through pictures and captions was an opportunity to reflect on the path that took her from teaching to being a computer scientist. This is how she talked about her experience with photo elicitation. I like to write a lot. 
I don't write very much anymore, but I always like to see the good in everything that I look at, that I experience, even though there might be bad sides to it. I kind of enjoyed that about this project, that I could use pictures or metaphorical ways of looking at my life and what I've gone through. I enjoyed that a lot. So I always did try and tie the picture into what I was writing about in some way or another. Doing this project was emotional because it's sad to think about the challenges that I've had and then super happy to think about all that I've overcome. And then, yeah, it's exciting and scary to think about the future because you never really know what's going to happen. So there was a wide variety of emotions that I've been able to think about as I was doing the project. Okay, so based on these findings, we would like to make some recommendations for institutions of higher education that are interested in recruiting and retaining Native students in computer science and other disciplines. Given that Native students want to give back to their communities, instituting applied learning opportunities in the curriculum that give back to the community and show students how to use their computing skills to give back would support these students' persistence in computer science. Native students want to learn about Native science. Thus, we recommend promoting Native science as legitimate science in curriculum. We recommend hiring and retaining Native faculty and particularly Native women so that Native students see themselves represented. Service, including community-based work and engagement, should count towards promotion and tenure for those faculty. As we have seen, learning more about their identities helps students build pride in being Native. Thus, institutions should include Native science and culture into the formal curriculum, integrate Native celebrations into the academic calendars, and offer student services that cater to Native students. Um, this concludes our presentation. We would like to acknowledge our Board of Advisors, Shannon Dean Begay, Rochelle Larson, and Stephanie Masta, and our funders, the Women of Color in Computing Collaborative, formed by the Caper Center and CJUST at Arizona State University. We would also like to thank you for your attention. We appreciate that you took the time to learn more about our efforts to bring the stories of these Native students to the general public. We will be happy to answer any questions and talk more about any of the issues in our Q&A or at any time through email. And our email addresses are on the slide. So feel free to ask any questions about this. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention is that um, the learning about being to spirit was um, a learning experience for us as well as part of the project. And part of it was, um, we, we talked about how it's a contested identity, not all groups of native peoples use this term. And one, um, one of the things that we learned was that not everyone who considers themselves to be LGBTQ plus in the native community considers themselves to be two-spirit. And one, um, an example, we have a, a, one of the students who identifies as bisexual, but she never mentioned being two-spirit. So that is one of the examples of how we learn as we do. Should I go ahead? Yes, please. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this. I always get excited hearing um, how the research is evolving because it's filling not only a void but but really encouraging um, many of us particularly in higher education to think more uh, completely and holistically and so that that is the question that I have is I a thousand percent agree with the suggestion in terms of PNT criteria um, being revisited um, however, I'd love to hear more in terms of what you think that would take, given what you know from your results, as well as um, a, your understanding of intersectionality as a framework to deconstruct systems. Don't laugh, Nodia. You know I was going to ask you this. 
<laughs> I did not know, Kim. Um, so um, for everybody else, Kim is part of CJEST at Arizona State. Um, so there, she's part of the group that funded this project. Um, so there's no pressure here for answering her question. <laughs> um, so what would it take? Um, well, as you know, the systems are very resistant to change. And um, one of the reasons that we talked about um, when Kathy was talking about the things that we recommend uh, to hire and retain more native faculty. Um, we need more native faculty in higher education so that they can grow into positions of power and they can help in changing things and moving things around. Stephanie saying yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so that's one thing I can think of. And my hope is that with the current environment, um, this, uh, you know, everybody's asking, how can we support communities of college, how, color? How can we um, work with them? How can we give them some of this power that we, that they haven't had and that white people have been, um, keeping for themselves. I'm hoping that that's going to be a push for those kinds of hirings and for those kinds of supports. So I think higher education really needs to look at how they are not supporting people of color and particularly women of color uh, to stay in, in the institutions. And imagine if it's hard in higher education, in general, it's particularly hard in in the STEM um, in the STEM careers, and particularly computer science, which is one of the disciplines where women are even have uh, a smaller representation than others. So, um, doing this reckoning that people are doing now, I'm hoping is going to help a little bit organizations really need to look at how they're not supporting and changing and trying to do some of that support that's not happening right now. I don't know if I'm fully answering your question, Kim. Um, this is like, how do you change the world kind of question. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, but so jump in a little Nuria. So I think, although I, I totally agree with um, hiring and retaining more Native faculty, and particularly women, uh, but I think there's a lot we can do for our students in the interim to seeing that shift, because I do think that would be a really big shift. <laughs> and I think, you know, it is going to take a lot of movement. Um, I think some of the things in the interim is for, um, faculty and um, departments to really encourage and communicate the um, the skills that their students are learning as a way that they can give back to their communities. So to help bridge that kind of gap in understanding that computer science doesn't just mean that you can go work for Google. You know, it means that you can work on data sovereignty projects for your tribal community. Um, and it also doesn't mean that you necessarily have to leave. There are a lot of jobs now, and in particularly um, when we think about computing, that could be done remotely. Um, and of course, there are still issues around digital divide and, and access to internet and, and things. Um, but I think when it it's possible to promote those ideas to students, we absolutely should. Um, and I think that's part of what we're seeing in our study is that um, the students are, that's, they're, all, they're making those leaps and those connections, the ones that we interviewed, you know, they are finding ways to give back um, and using their computing skills, like building um, a language app for their, for their native language. Um, but I think that 
that um, generally speaking, you know, Native students who are not already interested in computer science, for example, may not see those connections. So I think it's really important to, to do that, as well as to promote um, traditional knowledge and native science, native ways of knowing, um, indigenous ways of knowing as valid and just as valid as Western science. Um, that, and also really ensuring that these things are not um, opposing each other, um, but that can be viewed um, together and holistically. So I would say those shifts in culture don't have to be as monumental as say coming up with the funds to hire new staff. You know, th those are some changes that I think would be really meaningful that could happen right away if people educate themselves and understand um, why it's so important. Um, I hi, uh, my name is Claudia. Um, I work for the National Park Service and I was just wondering if while you were interviewing uh, the participants, they gave any details about how they um, kind of like, kind of how they work that um, nature or, or the Western science uh, with their culture. And the reason that I'm asking this is because um, I did a master's degree where I help gather information and I interview a environmental scientist, but she's also a, a Native American. So she went on a lot of detail on how she um, constantly, she had to be comparing Western science, or not comparing, but like blending Western science with environmental science. And like she explained when she was learning geology, how she uh, kind of like, to, in order to understand the geological process, uh, from the Western science point of view, she would use a lot of her like narratives from her tribe and like she went in a lot of detail on how she was um, using her narratives from her culture to understand these processes and like that she would say, oh, like, like, you know, at the end of the day, like my people and scientists are both observing things the same way, but it, they explain them in a different way. So I was just wondering if the same thing, like any of the participants went on details on how they see computer science and, and coding with um, like an explanation of how they blend those things or see similar similarities with um, some of their narratives that they hear in their culture. Um, Kathy, you wanna go first? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, we definitely see that. I think um, the students were definitely able to recognize um, areas where their culture and um, computing overlap, and maybe not in the methods of computing, but in like the end result. Um, so for example, we have one student who, um, really wanted to convey the meaning of aloha and she's native hawaiian in her um, work as a programmer to develop a mental health game a game a video game around mental health um, and so i think that we definitely saw our students making taking the cultural lessons that that they have and applying that to what they want to do with computer science. Um, and helping them to understand, using those cultural lessons to help, in, help them understand why they were doing it and the purpose of doing it. So um, yeah, I definitely, I, I think it's um, maybe not quite as um, intuitive as the connections you know to nature and the land um, but I still think that the values and stories um, are still very present. Um, and kind of continuing with the same student the native Hawaiian student that we call Lee um, she talked about how her native culture has science like how Native Hawaiians have always talked about the different levels in the atmosphere, 
or how or about the science of cooking so she was talking about how um uh, native dish what's the name kathy of the dish it's lao 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 exactly <laughs> lao lao um how you need to be very careful how you cook it because it can be toxic if you don't cook it properly so she was talking about <clears throat> even though this this were not um computer science content areas it was stem in general and they identified that as you know the area where they are learning so they made these connections about um you know their culture having science one thing also was how they brought their culture with science both native science and western science was their desire to give back so even we heard a couple of times i can think of at least one of the participants right now who said yes those western science and and native science belong together but i'm still figuring that out how but she was very clear that she wanted to do that was diana um who wanted to do the project for language preservation so she had a very clear idea that she wanted to use computer science in the context of her native culture and particularly in language preservation we had another participant um uh Kali, the one who talked to us that we showed you uh that she talked about her experiences with photo elicitation she was actually building an app to preserve her native language so we saw this effort to bring together their native cultures with the western science so even though they, it may not be the way you're talking about it claudia um they are making those efforts and a lot of this uh students were pretty young um like 1920 so they're still doing a lot of the personal discovery process so they're thinking about these things very actively and they will i mean i'm sure that they will do all these things and more um it's we caught them a little young in that sense to be able to tell us you know exactly how they're going to do all these things hey okay, awesome thank you so much it was a great presentation thank you claudia thank you for coming so I had a question. Um, first of all, thank you all. That was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what your plans are for dissemination and then thereafter with this work, do you have any plans for more research or keeping in touch with the subjects that you met with? I'm, I'm just thinking about future work too. Kathy, you want to talk about some of that? Sure. Uh, okay, so future research. Well, we we have submitted um, a proposal to National Science Foundation to their education core research solicitation. Um, building off of this idea, expanding to um, to the biological sciences, engineering, physical sciences, um, so more of the STEM fields. And um, then we're also I mean, pursuing another we have not submitted the proposal yet, but we'll be pursuing a proposal to do similar research um, with an ACES archival database that we've developed. Um, so yes, we still plan to continue pursuing um, understanding you know, factors that are contributing to persistence among Native students and professionals in STEM, um, and in particular, with a um, without a deficit kind of framework, um, so that's the the direction, and I think the area or the literature where we need to see a change and more studies around um, factors that make native students and professionals successful help them to persist. So that's a little bit. Um, I don't know that we have necessarily plans to follow up this specific group, but I think that's not to say that they might not be involved in future. Um, actually, when we were putting together the proposal um, in the fall, 
for the National Science Foundation, one of the things that we talked about was how cool it would be to follow up with the ones that participated in this study because it's a longitudinal study. So it would be actually very appropriate to follow up with them as a, as a longitudinal study. So, so the, the, the intention is there if we get that funding to, to do that. And in terms of dissemination, um, we are currently finishing our data analysis and we are starting to talk about what a manuscript is going to look like. We're like just finished and we're exactly at that point that we need to start writing. So that is the, the first dissemination effort that, that is going to be happening. And the other thing that we have in the bucket still is to seek um, um, a channel that speaks directly to the Native community. So we were planning on possibly publishing in Winds of Change or do something in, in more of a general, pop, general um, public in terms of native population um, dissemination to give back to the community that has given us all these beautiful pictures and this amazing data that we're working with now. Great, thank you very much. I did have a quick follow up and if I missed it, forgive me, but were all the research subjects from different institutions? They thought so, okay. Okay, thank you. So it was um, a national study because the this population is pretty small. Um, we didn't wanna just focus in one institution. We wanted to have wide representation. Um, so we have, I can think of North Dakota, Kansas. Um, I don't remember if Oregon or Washington, Oklahoma, New Mexico. So like really across the country. And we uh, recruited through ACES. So Kathy sent out the invitation to the database of students who who are participating in ACEs in one way or another. And, and these are the people who responded to our call. We had a couple of people who ended up not being able to participate uh, for you know, complicated lives, um, difficulties, coordinating schedules and things like that. But mostly everybody who um, who wanted to participate, participated in the, in the study. Oh, and we had representation from two tribal institutions. Is that correct, Kathy? At least two, and then mostly from predominantly white institutions, yeah, or, I think. Or native serving institutions. Or native serving, that's right. Thank you so much for this presentation. This is a fantastic project and I'm just thrilled to hear a bit more about the data um, from you all. I have a couple of quick questions. I know we're um, closer to time, um, at least for me. I've got other stuff I have to do this morning. But um, one is about, I found it really interesting that there was a participant who was um, bisexual who didn't identify as two-spirit and I guess I'm curious, and I don't know if this would fit into later work as a category or if it's something that you've already been thinking about, but I'm interested in the experiences of both um, participants who identified as LGBTQ plus Two-Spirit in a sense that we've taken Two-Spirit as kind of a special category here in the study. And I know that um, at least from my own um, work in queer and Two-Spirit Native communities that there tends to be a lot of overlap, <laughs> even if people don't identify as two-spirit. Um, so I'm just curious about how that showed up in the data and responses about um, computing and native identity and, and queer <laughs> two-spirit identity. Um, so that's, that's one question instead of um, questions. And then the other is about, uh, you just mentioned about the uh, native serving institution context. And I was also curious about anything that, that might've showed up for 
the differences and experiences that Native students had in one context or another. And I know that the N is really small, but I'd love to know if, if um, more of this connection between Native science and Native identity uh, was more salient or, or talked about in, in, a, in a different way um, from the participants from Native serving institutions. And I'll put myself on mute, thanks. You want so, me to um, oh. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> like, who wants to go, Nerd? <laughs> Um, so to the first question, Frida, it's, we wanted to be sensitive to the, to the question around identifying as two-spirit because we didn't want, we, we wanted them to self-identify. Um, we didn't want to, to put them in a bucket that they may not have felt like fit them. Um, and so we, we asked in a survey um, to collect participants in the beginning. Um, that's when we had all the questions around um, how they identified. So in our follow-up, in our prompts for the photo elicitation, then um, we asked it kind of in, in with the language of as a woman or two-spirit individual and or two-spirit individual. Um, you know, what were the barriers or the um, means of persistence. So we, you know, we asked those three prompts. Um, so I think we, we're not teasing out too much that queer experience um, that wouldn't, unless someone identified as Two-Spirit. So I think this would be a great area to follow up. Um, and so, yeah, there's not, we don't have a great answer for what you're talking about. So I, and I think Nuria could jump in here and talk about how um, that individual identifying as bisexual came up in the interview. Yeah. Um, so originally we had three people identify as LGBTQ and or two spirit one of them when i interviewed her it just turned out that the three um i interviewed personally um so and and she told me that she i mean she's 19 so she's very much discovering herself who she is and she said no i'm pretty sure i'm not bisexual as she originally had answered the question in the survey so in that sense it's like her identification changed from the time she did the survey to the time we interviewed her. So, so that was one. Um, so she did not really have anything to say about um, her identity in terms of sexuality or gender identity. Um, then the second one um, was our two-spirit individual and he identified as such in the survey and when we talked about when we interviewed him we specifically prompted about this so um he talked a little bit about how being to spirit gives him creativity and uh, more ways of problem solving etc and then the the woman who identifies as bisexual she's also very young also 19 or so and she was extremely comfortable with her sexual identity. She felt absolutely welcomed in her community. For her, being bisexual was not an issue in terms of her experiences in college. The issue was being a Native woman. So when she talked about being excluded or people having different expectations for her. It was not in the basis of her sexuality because she felt that she had a community that supported her. So it was, the experiences were very different um, in how they talked about it and how, um, yeah, and um, David didn't talk about being to spirit as a barrier at all. He always talked about it as a positive. You know, it gives me creativity, it gives me uh, problem solving views and um, other people look up to me because I'm different and they see that 
things can be done in a different way. So in terms of that, um, he didn't see it as a barrier. Um, so for me, one of the uh, eye-opening experiences was when we were at the ACES conference in October, I met someone who identifies as LGBT and he told me, well, I wouldn't be able to be in your study because you're looking for women and to spirit. I'm a man and I'm LGBTQ. And that was a surprise to me that he felt excluded from the two spirit category. Um, so that was, um, something that we will hopefully if we get funded for the next project we can have a lot more nuance in the work that we're doing and be able to to talk about it um, in a way that will not make people feel excluded so um and at, at that point we had already um we had already done uh the bulk of our interviews so we didn't really have the option to change what we were putting out in our survey and all that. Um, so that was definitely um, a learning moment for us. And that has continued to be. So we don't have as much nuance as that we would like, but we're learning as we're doing. Um, the other question, Frida, can you remind me of the other question? Because we've talked a lot about this one. No problem. Yeah, it was just about the differences in experience, if, if any emerge from the data about um, being in a native serving institution versus a PWI or different institution. Yeah. Um, so there was one participant, and I mean, I we ended up cutting out some beautiful slides that I did not want to cut out, <laughs> but people insisted that it was going to get too long. Um, but there, Krista um, talked about how she would never, ever leave her tribal college because she could keep her identity. She would never go to an Ivy League, even if she was offered a free ride, because she would be afraid of losing her language, her identity, her traditions. So for her being able to stay at, a, at an institution of higher education that not only respected but celebrated her identity with the ceremonies and holidays and uh, bringing in native science and all those things that were important to her man was a deal breaker if anything else came up she would be like no this is what i'm doing i would not switch that up and students who were in um, predominantly white institutions would talk about all the barriers and um, how peers could be could could exclude them um, very often without realizing by the things that they took for granted. The, Diana, the one who um, talked about wanting to do the language app to help with um, language preservation, she talked about how the white male students who were in the same lab that she was at, they took it for granted that they would be offered that job. And for her, it was like, overwhelming to get an offer such as that so the the experiences were definitely very different kathy um the institution where lee the our native hawaiian student was is that a predominantly white or a native serving institution do you know well i so i wanted to bring up the point that um there's there's different categories of institutions so there are tribal colleges and universities and then there are native serving non-tribal institutions. And those are part of the MSI, the minority serving institution kind of umbrella. And so um, we had a number of students that attended native serving institutions. So although those could still be predominantly white, um, they could also be R1 institutions. And so I think students, 
at the native serving institutions that were non-tribal, although we definitely heard from them the feelings of not belonging, it seemed like those are coming from not belonging in their department. Um, whereas I think they still had very strong social groups and um, programs that that they definitely reported as helping them persist in education, in higher education. Um, so I think there's a difference there too, although it may not be as kind of culturally based as you see in tribal colleges, um, especially in, in the sense of like connected to a specific tribe or land, um, they were, there were still strong, uh, there was still a strong community of other native students and faculty that, that helped them to feel supportive, supported. That's awesome. Thank you both so much. I have to jump off, but I really appreciate you all and this hard work you've done. Thank you, Frida. Um, one thing I wanted to say also is that um, there were students like, like Lee, our native, um, Hawaiian student who participated in a program that was um, helping her learn more about her native culture at the same time that it was supporting her to stay in computer science. So her experience also was very uh, specific in, in that way that even though she was at a, is it an R1? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in R1. Yeah. So it's an R1 predominantly white institution. She had that program that really supported her and allowed her to blossom into her Hawaiian identity. So that was also, um, you know, a different experience. It looks like we're at time and even past time. Thanks everybody for coming and staying. Uh, we really appreciate you listening to the stories of these Native students, and we hope that we will be able to tell you more in the future with new funding.